Oh, okay. So it's just. So, uh, so it's. Uh, we'll, whoops. So okay. So that's. Uh, that's a, Manchester Üniversitesi e, İngiltere'den e, bizimle birlikte e, bu e, e, Dr. Elliot'ı bizlerle buluşturan e, FEPS e, Eğitim Komitesi Başkanlığı'nı da yapan bir dönem e, fakültesi, e, üniversit e, üniversitemizin tıp fakültesinden, biyokimya departmanından e, Ferhan Hocamıza e, teşekkür ediyoruz. E, dolayısıyla bu e, departmanın e, sağlık üniversitesi ve fakültemizin bir ortak etkinliği şeklinde öğrencilerimizle e, Dr. Elliot'ı bir araya getirip e, CV hazırlama, kariyer e, gelişimi sırasında çok önemli olan gençler için bu konuda bizlerle e, deneyimlerini, bilgilerini paylaşacak. E, çok teşekkür ediyoruz. E, keyifli bir e, dinlet olacak. Ben de heyecanla bekliyorum. Çok kısaca da İngilizce kendisine bir şey yapmak istiyorum. So uh, today, Dr. Uh, Professor Dr. Keith Elliott is with us uh, from Manchester University, uh, London, uh, United uh, Kingdom. So we, we are very proud to host them uh, at our faculty, faculty of uh, pharmacy. And this is a joint action of um, uh, biochemistry department of uh, faculty, uh, medical faculty and our uh, institute. Uh, and. Uh, Faculty of Pharmacy. So we are looking forward to hear your speech about preparing your CV, uh, how to make the most of yourself. And I will uh, let the uh, see to you. Doktor Keith Elliot'ı çok uzun tanıtmayacağım. Çünkü zaten konumuz aslında bir CV'nin nasıl hazırlanacak. Kendi CV'sinden örnekler verecek, vererek anlatacak için. Biz detayına girmeyeceğiz. Ama sadece şunu söylemek istiyorum. Ülkesinde e, biyokimya ve e, biyosayans e, derneklerinin e, eğitim komisyonlarında görev almış. Avrupa'da Eurobio'nun ve FEPS Eğitim Komisyonu'nun kurucu üyesi olarak görev almış ve 2014'te de FEPS Diplom Donör ile onurlandırılmış. Eğitime gerçekten emek veren, gerçek bir eğitimci bulunacağız. Kendisini de umarım bu ilk ve son birlikteliğimiz olmaz. Bundan sonra da onun deneyimden faydalanabiliriz. Özellikle eğitimle ilgili de farklı görüşlerini dinlemek isteriz. Now it's my honor to uh, invite you, uh, Dr. Kate Elliott. Uh, I didn't mention much about no. the CV. I hope you will be I will, yes. For us. Thank you. Right. Thank, thank you very much. Um, Yes, it's a pleasure to be here. It's my fifth time in Izmir, uh, and it's the third university I've spoken in. I've been in Dokuzoyel and in the Economic University, so it's my first time in your university, so it's a, a pleasure to be here. Um, as I'm... if I get the right... Uh, yeah. As I'm talking about CVs, I think the best thing to do is for me to start by giving you my CV, at least a, a very simple version of it, to explain to you why I'm doing this, where I've come from, and hopefully to justify why I have some experience and some knowledge I can pass on to you, which is what you will need to do when you're producing your own CVs. So uh, use this as a, a very simple example of what can go on. I'm a, a biochemist. Whoops, sorry. Um, biochemist um, by training, did my degrees in the University of Cambridge a long time ago now, uh, a postdoc at the University of Kent in, in UK, and then I was a, a lecturer, senior lecturer, assistant professor, associate professor at the University of Manchester for many years. Uh, I actually retired a number of years ago but have continued doing other things since, and I taught science and medical students at that university for, for many years. Um, my professional background um, I am a member of the UK Biochemical Society and for a number of years I chaired the Education Committee of the UK Biochemical Society because I, I developed a, an interest not just in research, which I continue to do, but a lot in education and student development um, throughout my career. I set up um, 
and chaired the Education Committee of the Bioscience Federation, which uh, is now called the Royal Society of Biology. And that was a federation of all the biological societies in the United Kingdom, um, some 40 different societies together. So I set that up. So again, uh, linking into education. And I was a founder member of the FEBS Education Committee some 20 years ago now, uh, which is why I'm here. As you may gather, we had a meeting, uh, a very nice meeting, uh, uh, last week, um, just south of Urla. Um, and I've been running this sort of session for students at, we, before our main congress, we have what we call a Young Scientist Forum. Uh, and I know some of you, I don't know whether anybody here is coming to that, but I know there are some students from this university who will be going to that Young Scientist Forum in Lisbon uh, in July. As part of that, we always run a careers advisory session, and I've been talking now for some 15 years about CV production to those participants. I've also a lot of industry links, and I think this is important because one of the problems with a, a lot of academic uh, staff is that they haven't had links with industry. So they know what to look for in an academic CV, but they don't necessarily know what industry is looking for, and they're not always looking for the same thing. So it's important to realise that there are different ways of presenting yourself depending on which sort of job you're looking for. So I, had a, I was careers advisor for the Biochemical Society uh, a number of years ago, and as part of that role, we always had careers conferences for students, for undergraduate students and postgraduate students. And within that, we always got somebody from the human resources department from a big company to come and talk to us about what it is they are looking for uh, when they see an application. If I told my students what to do, they probably wouldn't listen. But if they tell them what to do, they may have said exactly the same things, but they listen because that's the person that's going to employ them later on. So it was very important to actually get that information from the companies. And, and really what I've, I do now is a, a distillation of what I've learned from probably going to maybe 50 or 60 of those conferences over a period of 20 years. So from different companies, what they're looking for. But also in the UK, we have something called a sandwich degree. It's a lovely term. It's a sandwich degree because they sandwich one year working in industry in the middle of their their degree program. So in the UK normally it was a three year degree, they would take four years, one year they'd work in industry. I set that up in my university and as part of that I was interacting with many um, industries across the country in the pharmaceutical industry, food industry, all sorts of industries where we had all sorts of biologists working. So I hope that gives you an impression and you'll see later on why I do this because what your CV should be doing is giving evidence of what you can do. So I hope this gives you evidence of why I think I'm probably competent to give you some information about writing a CV. Um, oops, get the right. That's the one. Right. So why do you need a CV? It's pretty obvious really, I guess. I suspect, is everybody here at least a PhD student? Anybody still a master's student? Okay, but you will have needed a CV of some sort to apply for your PhD. You're probably thinking about going on to do a postdoc. You'll need a CV for that. Some of you may even get a job uh, and you'll need a CV for that. But also, if you're applying for a fellowship, you'll need a CV. But particularly, and, and people don't often realise this, now, if you're applying for a grant, a research grant, you'll also need a CV to go alongside that because they're looking there, have you got a track record of delivering what you said you would deliver and that's part of your CV. So you need it in all sorts of things. This really relates to industry. It's a shock tactic to some extent, but it's actually real. The 30 second test. Can you get over to the person reading your CV in 30 seconds that you are worth interviewing. And it is not facetious. In industry, this can be real. Because what a lot of students don't realise is that if you send your CV to a company, it will not be seen by the scientist. If you're lucky, it'll be seen by a human resources department within that company. But in many cases, it's not even seen by the company first. They use recruitment agencies to scan and sim down the, the number of of applicants 
before they ever get to the company. So it's important that you get the information. Those are not professional scientists that will see your CV. They are human resources people who don't necessarily understand the details of the science, but they will be looking for key information within the CV to see is this person going to be hopefully on the, uh, if I get the right, on the yes pile, definitely not on the no pile or on the maybe pile. And of course, if the yes pile is big enough, the maybe pile becomes the no pile. So they may get 100 applications, let's say, the company may say, we only want the top 10. So 90% might be rejected before they're ever seen by the company. So it's important that you get the information through before. So what's the, what's the secret of success when you're trying to produce a CV? Well, it's targeting. It's really like, I try to link this to your own science careers. It's like starting a research project. When you start a research project, you do the reading beforehand. You read what's, what's happened before. You find out what you need to know. And you need to do the same thing if you're applying for a job. Um, I, I'll come back to that in a moment. I also like to link the idea of writing your CV to writing a research publication. Because a lot of the way of writing it is the same as thinking about a research publication. When you have your research publication, sorry, let's go backwards, um, you write, what, what have you discovered so far? So what, what have you discovered or developed? What do, you want, what do your peer reviewers or readers want to know? What results have you got to back up the claim? And that's very important. You wouldn't think of writing a paper if you didn't have any results to justify what you've said. And what are the conventions of the style? What's the, the journal conventions? I like to think of a CV in the same way. What have you discovered? What skills and knowledge you've got? What have you done? So that's what, uh, what you've discovered. What will the potential employer want to know? What do your readers want to know? But most importantly, what have you done in your life to back up the claims that you've got? What evidence can you present to somebody that you can do what you say you can do? I can say, you know, I could fly to the moon, but I've got no evidence to prove it. Uh, you need to prove that you can do what you say. And what's considered professional style of writing a CV? Uh, and we'll see in a moment, there's, there's no right way. There's lots of wrong ways, but there's no really one right way of doing this. So, you're thinking about applying for a job, uh, you're coming to the end of your PhD, uh, you're writing a, a CV, how do you go about it? Well, there are lots of things you can do. Uh, if you're applying for a, a job that's advertised, then the, uh, the job will probably have what we call a job specification or a person specification. The job specification says what you're going to do when you're going to work in that job. The person specification says what they are looking for in you, what skills they're looking for in you. How can you find out more? Well, websites, uh, if it's companies, recruitment sites. If, it, if you're looking for a postdoc, you will go, I'm sure, you will look at the, the website of the, the, the university, the lab that you're going to try to apply for. You can look at news items, you will obviously, I hope, look at the publications of the people that you're applying for. Um, and uh, you know, it, it really does not go down very well if you go to, to an interview with somebody and you haven't read their publications. Uh, you don't know what they've actually been doing. And talk to them. Um, recruitment fairs, maybe. Conferences. Mutual contacts. When you're young and you're trying to develop your careers, use all the contacts you've got. Your professors have contacts. Uh, they know people. They know people who know people. Uh, when you go to conferences, talk to people there. Uh, if you like somebody that's a speaker, then talk to them. Most high-level scientists like being flattered. Uh, if you go to talk to them and say, I'm very interested in what you're doing, you will have difficulty stopping them talking to you. Uh, so do talk to people. Don't be afraid to talk to people at conferences uh, and any sort of meetings. And if possible, you might even be able to arrange a, a visit. 
Uh, nowadays you might do a, a Zoom meeting rather than perhaps a visit, but to arrange to talk to somebody directly before you perhaps make a formal application. So, let's come now to actually the, the, the production of the CV itself. What should you be doing? And, and I should say at this stage that it's never too early to start thinking about your CV. When I talk to uh, people at the Young Scientist Forum, I get very frustrated when somebody says to me, oh, I, I'm not thinking of applying for a job for another year. So it's too early to think about my CV. My answer to that is already too late. You should be thinking of CV as soon as you start, build it up, build up a, a portfolio of what you've got, an electronic portfolio. What have you done? Because what you don't want to do is to produce your CV, hit the send button and then say, oh no, I forgot to say this. Um, you need to have all the information there. You can then select what you put in to depend on which sort of job you're applying for, where you're applying to, to go. And most of it is common sense. It's thinking about what would you like to do with yourself. Um, so it, it, it really is common sense. Um, whoops, sorry, I'm getting the wrong... <laughs> no, I'm, getting, I'm hitting the wrong button again. Here it is. Um, allocate space. Well, make it easy to read. You, you, you want it to be easy to be read. You don't want to have to, someone have to search for the information. Because if they have to search for the information, particularly if it's a human resources or a recruitment agency, they might not find it. If it's not there on the front page, they're not necessarily going to look at the back of the last, last page. They're going to give up when they've read the first page. Allocate space in accordance with the importance of the information. And that's quite in, particularly important as you, you get through your career. What's more important, your PhD, your masters, your undergraduate or your school? It's your PhD, so your PhD should have most space, your master's a little less, your undergraduate a little less still, because what defines you generally is the last thing you've done. That's what you're trying to sell yourself on. So, uh, as you'll see later on, that doesn't always happen. Be positive. If you're not positive about what you've done, then nobody else is going to be. Uh, you've got to sell yourself, and it really is selling yourself at this stage. And it's, it's, a, it's a big marketplace. Obviously, if you can, perfect your grammar and spelling. Uh, and if possible, in many cases, obviously, if you're going on to postdocs, you may well be applying in English. Get somebody else to read it. If possible, a native speaker, but if not, somebody who has a good, a good uh, grasp of English. And again, many of your professors will have very good grasp of English. Um, I sometimes find that the people I talk to have better English than I have, and, and yet they are obviously not English speakers. So get somebody to read it, you're, you're doing things properly, um, because that gives a good impression. Keep it to two or three pages, two generally, and that doesn't include your references, your references are extra, and you might put some other things as well, uh, a sum of detailed summary of your research or something, that can be extra, that's not uh, part of your CV. And always send a covering letter, unless you're told not to, occasionally that happens. But always send a letter, and if I have time, I'll deal a little bit about the covering letter later on, but um, there will be this PDF sent to you later on uh, with it, and the PDF that you will get has actually rather more than I'm talking about in the talk today. And at the end of it, there are, I think, about five or six pages of... Uh, links about producing CVs, about cover letters, uh, and some uh, examples that I'll, I'll talk to you later on from, from a variety of different areas, from industry, from academia, uh, from the Nobel um, Institute, uh, from the NIH in the, the US. So there's a lot of links, and they will all be clickable from the, the PDF that you've got. Okay. Right. The content now. We're, now we're, we're, we're getting down now. You, you've got the idea. We're now trying to get to the detail. There is no real one way of doing things. Uh, as I say, there are, there are wrong ways, but there's no one right way. The most important thing is it's logical. It's clear. You have clear headings. Get the most important things on the front page. immediately. Uh, if you've got something which is related to the job you're applying for, make sure it's right there on the front page so it can be seen, not hidden at the back. Um, use language employer will understand. 
which means generally don't use abbreviations. We always, in the, we're all the same. In the lab, we use abbreviations for things. Some of them are common ATP, we all know what ATP is, but you might use abbreviations for things you do in the lab. Don't use them because they may not be the one, they may not be common, even the scientists may not understand them, and certainly the, the non-scientists reading it first won't understand them. It might be something directly related to what you're wanting to work on, but if you use a, an abbreviation for it that's not understood, it'll get discarded. Um, and use strong positive language. I can do this, I will, uh, not, not, I might be able to. Um, so now we're coming down to more de detail. I say there's no one right way of doing it. There are three basic ways that you can write a CV. And I've separated them out here. One is the so-called academic CV. And that's something you'd apply, use if you're applying for an academic position, particularly for a postdoc. And that has a lot of information about your academic career. I'll show you those in a moment. For jobs, when you tend to move outside academia, you would use a similar sort of CV, which uh, we'll call a chronological CV. And the important thing is there that things are in date order. Many of you, and this is one of the, the things, I mean, I don't know in this room how many people will actually end up being professional scientists. Many people I mean, in the UK, I know that at least 50% of the students that start a biochemistry degree will not use their biochemistry directly at the end. They will move into other jobs. Um, they will use the skills they've developed in their degree to get other jobs. And so they can use a skills-based CV where you actually look for the skills that are required and show how you can do that. And um, there's also something down which is called a narrative CV, which I gather is not particularly happening here in Turkey, but if you're applying for jobs in other countries, you might find something called a narrative CV, and I'll talk to you a bit about that in a moment. So let's look at the academic CV. In the academic CV, you really are putting in more detail about your academic career, because that's what academics want to know about. They want to know about your career, your lab career, your degree and so on. They want to know all the details of your academic career. Academics are very bad. We'll read anything. Uh, human resources won't. If you send it to an academic, they will probably read it, um, even if it's not that great. But human resources will definitely not. Um, and of course, in an academic career, your publications are paramount. The more publications you've got, the better. So that's, that goes on at the end of your CV. Um, most importantly, again, Put the most recent things first, because they're the most important. If you're a postdoc, what you're doing with your postdoc is important. If you're a PhD student, what you're doing with your PhD is most important. And then work down, decreasing the amount of space in your early, earlier in your career. Um, when you write your publications, again, make sure they're in the right order. Separate out the refereed from the non-refereed, the, the conference there. So you're highlighting the, the refereed ones. And it's very good to, to highlight your name put it in bold or underline it so you know they can see immediately where you are in there. Sometimes, you know, nowadays people talk about what percentage they've had in there as well, so you can put that in, but, but just make sure you highlight your name in the reference list so it can be picked out where you are. This, I don't expect you to read this, this it's deliberately like this. Um, it comes from the website of my own university, the University of Manchester, um, and the link is in the PDF that you'll get later on. They have a, a section on careers and CV production, and they've done the same CV in three different ways. It's a fictitious CV of somebody studying physics. Um, and they do one for the, the academic, one for the uh, chronological, and one for the skills base, using the same information, but just showing you how you can do it in a different way. All I want you to see here is the balance of information. I, don't, I deliberately don't want you to read it. You can read it later on when you see it, but I, at the moment I don't want you to be able to read it. So here you can see on this one. A um, little tiny bit of information, name and address, how to be contacted. That doesn't need to take a lot of space. One person actually said to me, he doesn't mind if it's at the end. He's only interested, the only reason your name and address is of any use to him is if he wants to contact you to offer you an interview. So, that's not going to get you a job. The more you put up there, 
the less space you've got to get the good things on the front page. So keep that short, no more than that, where your name, address, contact, uh, and that, that's it. Then in this case, this bit here is education. PhD, Masters, or BSc in this case, uh, and then a tiny bit at the bottom here about the school. You'll see in here, if you look at it properly, this person had, had spent a year abroad as well. So that's important. If you've got a year abroad as part of your, uh, as your degree programme, make sure that's highlighted right in the front page. That's really important. And then here, the rest of the front page, research interest. So it's a research-based academic CV, put it in there. On the second side here, again, more, more research experience. You know, if someone's worked in a lab, you may have worked in a lab during the summer. Um, you may have worked in a lab while you're doing your, your degrees, as well as doing your academic work. Put that in, because that's an important skill that you've gained. And remember, the earlier you are in your career, you haven't got very much information. You've got to make the most of everything you've got. Later on in your career, you've got lots of information, and the problem then is deciding what to leave out. The, uh, to get it to two pages. The problem you have at the beginning of your careers is what can I put in there in those two pages to make me stand out. And here, other skills, teaching and administrative skills. Uh, if you've, many of you, you'll demonstrate to students in your, uh, as PhD students, you'll demonstrate in laboratory classes to undergraduate students. You'll help master students in the labs, teaching ex experience in there. Put that in, it's important. You may go out into a school, you may go into a high school, even elementary school, and teach kids there. That's important, it shows communication skills. A um, number of times I see CVs, and I'll see it later on, where there's nothing about teaching. And I talk to the people and they say, oh, I'm, it's a research job. They're not interested in teaching. But then I say to them, well, you're in a lab, are there postdocs in your lab? Yes. Do the postdocs help you? You're a PhD student. Oh yes. Do the postdocs teach you? Yes. Is teaching important? Oh yes, it is. Teaching is important, even in an academic environment, in an academic research environment. We're teaching everybody all the time when we're doing our research. And then some little bits at the, the, the bottom here. Any other thing? Any committees you've been on? Any experience you've got in uh, organising things? Because if you're going to go into a lab as a postdoc, PhD student even, the PI is going to want you to be able to do things for him. If you've got organisational skills, again, think what happens in your lab. If you're in a big lab, the PI might not be there most of the time. It's the postdocs that run the lab. There may even be labs where the PhD students are running it. So any organisational skills you've got, which can be got from anywhere, it doesn't have to be in your science, and that's the important thing. It doesn't have to be in science that you've got this here. So, if you're applying for jobs in industry, very similar sort of uh, CV you produce. Um, personal details, education, work history, positions of responsibility, skills, interests. But it, it's quite similar, but, but basically there's, there's just a slight difference in balance between the information. Less detail, perhaps, of the absolute academic uh, work, because they're more interested in skills. Um, I remember talking to a colleague from industry many years ago at one of the careers conferences um, and I asked her how much does it cost you to employ somebody and this is probably now 30 years ago and she said it probably costs us about £50,000 to employ a person before they ever start in the work to start in work you can imagine £50,000 60,000 euros 20 or 30 years ago, that's a lot of money. So when they're employing somebody, they're not looking for somebody necessarily just to do the work this year, they're looking for somebody that can do the work in five, ten years' time to develop. So they're looking for the skills that people have got. They invest a lot of money. And we don't see this, but the HR department, the interviews, all the work that goes through, the training, they invest a lot of money in a, in a person before they, they start. Um, Use some examples. I remember a friend of mine working for a company, I won't name the company, but they decided to close down the, the, the, the lab that she was working in. She had a choice. Basically, either get out or get to a, another subject. She moved lab and became a, a vice president. That's the sort of person they're looking for. They're not looking for the person that says, 
oh, well, I, I'm not doing what I want to do, I'm going to leave. They're looking for someone that can develop with their, the company. So here we've got the academic career, perhaps not quite as much detail, but now perhaps more on work experience here, scientific work experience, but other work experience. And even just being a waiter, a, a waitress in your, your summer holiday, in the evenings, that's experience that you can use, and I'll come back to that in a bit later on. Um, and again, other positions of responsibility and interests that we have here at the bottom. Um, you can be a member of a team. Uh, I had one uh, person who didn't have it on her CV. She was an international basketball player at the same time as doing her PhD. Now, so it doesn't important, but yes, it is important because it shows you've got team working skills, you can interact with other people, you've got determination. To be an international sports person at the same time as doing your PhD, you've got some drive, something that, that tells me something about you as a person. Okay, if you're going to move out of science, and at the moment I suspect most of you are not thinking about that, but a lot of you will do in the long term, then what you've got to do is to show you've got the skills that you've uh, that are required by the, the job that you're looking for. And again, you can see here, I've got some information, but the important thing is looking at this uh, next version here. And now it's turned round a bit. We've got the academic career, it's just this little tiny bit here, not much there at all. But what the front part now is, listing the key skills, and so you need to look to see what is this job looking for, what skills are they looking for in this job that I'm applying for, and list them, I can't even read these myself, but, I, but, but the skills, you take that from the job specification, from the, uh, the, the person specification. How can, there are these four skills here. Computer literacy, communication, um, things like that. How can I demonstrate that I've got those skills? So you, you list the skills that are in the job and then show what you have done to show that you've got the skills for, for that job. Then they're not so interested in your academic inf information. Really, what you've got here, your work experience, is often used to generate the information you've got in here, where you've got the skills in there. And, and then, again, positions of responsibility. Use that information to generate the, uh, the skills that you've got later on. This is something which is fairly new, but is coming in more and more in Western Europe, and I'm sure it will come here in the long term, and it's particularly being used in areas where uh, you're applying perhaps for a fellowship or for a, a senior fellowship or a promotion of some sort. It's a skills-based CV, but it's called a narrative CV. It's narrative because you describe what you can do. And generally, if in science, there's, um, you, you still have the personal details, but only in small amount. But now, the sort of questions you might get asked is, how have you contributed to the generation and flow of new ideas, of hypotheses? In other words, what have you done in your, your science? So you've got to talk about what you've done. How have you demonstrated your potential to lead in a research field? Because they'll be looking for leaders, for PIs of the future. Um, what have you contributed to the wider research community? How have you, how have you disseminated the information? What, confidence have you been to? How have you linked in with other people? Um, and how possibly have you exploited your research? I mean, obviously, more and more now we get to commercial exploitation of, uh, of your work rather than just simply the, um, the, the, the, the publication in uh, academic journals. So that, that's something you may come across. In the, I won't do any more about that, but I, I've given some links again in the PDF later on so you can see that. Okay, so, so that's basically the, the important points. Now I'm just going to come to see the sort of the mistakes that we've seen <laughs> to a large extent. Um, this again comes from, from contacts with industry, from my own career service in my university. Um, make it easy to read is the important thing. Edit it. Don't try to put too much information in. Um, but at the same time, uh, don't actually waste space. Don't, don't put lots of space. I always say to students that a lot of white space on the page suggests there's a lot of white space up here somewhere. Um, if, you, if you can't fill the space properly, then that's not good. 
Make sure it's all lined up. There's no excuse nowadays for a poorly produced CV. Word processing, software, you should be able to, it, it, they all should look perfect. Um, no excuse at all. And if you're cutting and pasting, make sure you cut and paste properly. Um, for a short sentence, it, it, it's not a long essay, it's not a dissertation. You just want to get short key, key sentences in there to say what's important. So break it up with bullet points. Um, and don't try to get too fancy. We're not, you, you're not, well, presumably you're not applying uh, to do some sort of creative art. Uh, you're applying for something in science. Don't start putting in all sorts of changes in fonts and colours and highlighting and so on. It just distracts in, in some things. A big question here, which, I, which surprised me when I, I got asked about it initially, or in fact when I first started looking at CVs for FEBS, was I got lots of CVs with photographs on them. And that amazed me, because in the UK and the US, which are both I know well, you never did that. You don't put a photograph on your CV. But a lot of them were coming from Germany and Austria, and they did. And I gather from just talking here that in Turkey it's quite common to do so. That's fine. But I was told by one of my friends in the USA, if she saw a CV with a, a photograph on it, it had to be rejected straight away. Because you would not be uh, looking at the person in a, uh, a way which is not potentially looking at discrimination. They're trying to sell themselves on what they look like, not on what they can do. Reject it. So in some cases, a photo is actually putting you on the no pile. Uh, be careful. Make sure you know what the convention is of the country you're, right, you're applying to. So Germany, Austria, Turkey, fine. UK, America, no. Um, so just find out, that's the important thing. So in, within FEBS, over the last 15 years, I've probably read 600 CVs um, from mainly post, postgraduates and postdocs. And, and this is, these next few slides are a distillation of the mistakes I think I've seen in them. Um, but as I say, there's no right way, there's lots of wrong things you can do. Um, a list, just a list of degrees. I'll have a room when, at, at YSF of 100 people. So to, you're basically all the same. You've all done a degree in biochemistry or molecular biology or pharmacy or something similar. You're, you're all either doing a PhD or you've just done your PhD and you're doing a postdoc. What is it about you? It's not just a list of your degrees. You've all got those degrees. What is it that makes you different from the other 99 people in the room? Uh, what is it that makes you stand out? What can you highlight? The wrong balance of information. I've seen ones where you've got that much on the undergraduate degree and that much on the PhD. Maybe a title. In some cases, I've seen CVs, they don't even put their title of their, their PhD in it, let alone tell me about what they're doing. Um, <laughs> Isn't that important? Um, tell me about techniques, but no idea of what the competence of that, those techniques are. You know, uh, are you very good? Is it something you use regularly, something you've, you've developed yourself? You, you, you run it for the lab, things like that. Give me a, an, an indication of what else you can do. I've mentioned the teaching already. Uh, I've mentioned the jobs already. The, the other jobs you do, yes, put them in, but only put them in because you can use the skills that you've gained in those jobs to tell me what you can, can do. It's not the job itself that matters, it's what you've learned from the job that matters. No information about sorry, awards and scholarships. If you've been given an award, you've got the best poster award, or you, you've got a, a good um, PhD award for your, uh, to, to pay your stipend, tell me about it, because somebody has judged you already, and they've already judged you to tell, you, to tell me that somebody else thinks you're good as well. And no information about interest. It's not a big thing, but it is a little thing. I always like to know a bit about the person that I'm going to employ, uh, not just about their, their science. So th their interests outside are useful as well. Presentation, I want to see the most recent first. I don't want to see too much space in space, and I don't want to see it too, uh, too close together. This came back from a major pharmaceutical company. This isn't my information. This is what they told me about what they look for. So a good CV and a covering letter tailored to the job. So it's targeted to what you're trying to apply for. Um, that's important. They obviously want a good academic background. 
And they want that right up the front and in chron reverse chronological order, the most recent thing first. Highlight the skills. Um, you know, sometimes you can, you can just make it bold. I wouldn't suggest doing it in red, but you can, you know, you've got a skill, highlight that skill and make it bold in, in the, the, the piece of information you're giving. Um, gaps. If you've got gaps in your career, you may have had to leave the university for a time or something. You've probably did something during that time. Make the most of it. Say what you've actually done during that time rather than just trying to ignore it. Um, outside activities. Again, use the skills that you've gained rather than just saying what the outside activity is. What have you gained from doing it? Because that's what's important. Don't use text speak. Write properly. And be prepared to talk about whatever you write because hopefully you'll get an interview. Um, you can write the most fabulous CV. If you can't then live up to it when you go in for the interview, you're not going to get the job. So, in summary, a CV and a cover letter is a chance for you to show your skills. Um, what makes you stand out? Um, and it will get you an interview. A bad CV and a cover letter, you will get rejected. So you will never be seen. That's the important point. I'll very quickly just mention the cover letter because this is mainly about CVs. This is all in the, the, the handout you'll get, the, the PDF. A cover letter should go alongside your CV. I like to think of the cover letter, going back to my analogy to writing a, a paper, the cover letter is the discussion and conclusion. The CV is the data, it's the, it's the evidence that you've got. They shouldn't repeat each other, but the information you put in the cover letter should take information from your CV to say why you are the best person to apply for the job, why the best person to apply for a postdoc. It might not be a job that's advertised, it might just be applying speculatively to do a postdoc in another lab. Why, why should I take you on? Um, introduction usually quite short, but a paragraph to introduce how did you hear of the job, how did you hear of the lab, why are you interested in going there. Um, I was going to show, unfortunately I'm not going to be able to show it, but if, if you see the, the PDF, do look at the, the link I'll show you later on at the Nobel Prize winners. There's a lovely one from a guy called Randy Sheckman, but I'll, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat basically what he says in it. Um, what makes you a strong candidate? Try to address all the criteria that are being asked for. Uh, even if you're only weakly doing it, at least try to, or if you can't, perhaps there's one thing you, you can't necessarily say you can do, try to explain why you think you'll be able to do it, how you can develop to improve. It's a formal letter, and this is where it comes back to cutting and pasting. If you're writing a formal letter to, let's say, GlaxoSmithKline, um, don't cut and paste one which says, I've always wanted to work for Pfizer. Um, <laughs> uh, be careful when you cut and paste. It's very easy to cut and paste. Uh, it should always be a different letter, a different CV for every job you apply for, but be very careful and be very careful to write things. Um, examples of errors that, that we got, uh, the, the, the, the most common one that used to come up started off with dear sir or modem. Uh, think about it. <laughs> um, spell check on your computer. Um, madam, modem, very close. Um, uh, make sure you, you put the, the, the right words in there. Try, if you can, to address it to a specific person, um, particularly if you arrive for a postdoc. Um, be concise and be positive. Use, use I can do it. So many scientists are very poor at selling themselves. They sell their research. They talk about, my lab did this, my group did this. I'm not applying your lab. I'm not, I'm not um, employing your PI. I want to employ you. What can you do? What did you do within the project yourself rather than what did your lab do? Someone said to me, or, that, well, it, it's very rude to say I. I'm sorry, it might seem rude in everyday life, but it's certainly not rude when you're applying for a job. You're, you want to know what can be done. And there's a guy called uh, Detlef Riesner who worked, he was an academic um, who actually was involved with setting up Kiagen and he used to give us some talks to our education group in FEBS and he said students of, of the economy, by which he meant I think business students, economic students, they're very good at selling themselves. 
Science students are very bad at selling themselves. They'll sell the science, they'll sell what they love to, they will not sell themselves, which is what really matters. A um, couple of final slides here. Be careful. It could be too late, but be careful what you put on the web. Everyone will search for you. I know when I give talks, people search for me. I'm sure people have looked up my name and, and say, what, what's on the, the web in my name? Um, and hopefully they only find good things. But they will get in and they'll look what you've put on uh, social media sites. There have been a many high profile cases where we've seen people have, have found, they put, they've got a job and then they've, someone's picked up that they've put some really rather unpleasant things on their personal um, social media sites in the past and they've lost their jobs as a result of that. So be careful what's there. They will search for you. Um, be, be assured of that. <coughs> and even what your friends put on, I'm afraid, it, it's very unfortunate that that's the case, but that's what life is at the moment. This is the one I was hoping to show you a... Um, uh, the, the link to the top one here from Randy Sheckman. Uh, do look at it when you get the do click on it and look at it. Look at all those because those four there are actually what, about what people are looking for and these are Nobel Prize winners so these are right at the top there um, about what they're saying. Randy Sheckman, it's a lovely clip. He's very arrogant but he can afford to be his Nobel Prize winner so he's looking for the best and he starts off and I, I can't do the American accent to go with it but he starts off by saying, the vast majority of applications I get show no thought whatsoever. And he really stresses it in that way. No thought whatsoever. They, I just discard those. I don't even read them. Um, uh, he can afford to do it. Uh, we can't all be in that position. But basically, what he's saying is, they may, if they're lucky, they may say, dear Professor Sheckman. A lot of them will say, dear sir, reject it. They're not addressed to him personally. They say, I've always wanted to work in your lab. Uh, it would be great for me. Reject it. What they want, he wants to know, is what can you do for him in his lab? He's not there, he's not there as a, uh, he's not philanthropic. He's there to get the best out of you to help him. So it's what can you do? So I say, do, do, if you don't read the others, do read that one or listen to that one. It really is an eye opener uh, and it's quite interesting to see it. But the others also, Look about things. And that's actually quite a good website as well, um, the, the Nobel Prize website. There's lots of information on there. Um, I think that's the last of the slides I've got here, yes. But with the, the, the PDF that you've got, there are, I think, about another six pages which have got links to various websites about producing CVs, more examples. You can see the details of the, the University of Manchester one that I showed you there. But another university is, um, I've got some links to uh, places like Nature and Science, the, the, the magazines, uh, where they have adverts for them. And actually, they also have uh, resources there for, um, uh, uh, for your CV and so on. I've got some to the Biochemical Society in the UK, which talks about how to apply for jobs. Um, there's, I think, there's a, there's a, if I remember right, there's a clip from NIH, somebody talking about what they're looking for when they're uh, applying for jobs. There's, there's quite a lot of information there. And there's a lot more information about the, the CV and cover letter in detail. I hope I've not gone too long. I think I've tried to, to keep to the time. And if anyone has any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. And I should say, as, as I mentioned, my email is at the, the front of the, uh, of, of the talk. If you have any questions, if you even want me to look at your CV, just send it to me. I mean, I won't promise to go through it in a huge amount of detail, but I will certainly tell you what's good and what's bad and what needs changing if, if you send it to me. I can do that fairly quickly. If it comes as a, either a PDF or a, a Word file, it's easy just to annotate them and just send those back. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. It was very informative and very inspiring. And now I can take some questions from the audience. Sorry. Uh. <laughs> Maybe. Okay. Do you have good time to hear in Turkey? And I want to ask that um, some people add a short summary of their research, their experiences on their. Uh, yep. Yes. I. I, I, I you can. 
There are two things you can do. What I would recommend, but, but again, you, you might want to talk to people and find out what they want. What I would recommend is that within your CV, um, if I, well, if you can remember, well, I won't go back to it at the moment, if you, if you can remember the academic CV, there was about that much space in, in the page, which had a very short summary. Put, it, put the key things in there. You can then add a one-page abstract, extra. That's not part of your CV. So you have your CV, which is probably two pages. You, you could have an abstract of your research, which may be an abstract of a couple of different pieces of research if you're a postdoc. You know, your postdoc, and there's a little bit about your PhD, particularly if you're applying for a job where something you've done in your PhD or even in your master's is relevant to the job. Put that in. Um, and then put your, your publications. And so, yeah, that, that's two ways of doing it. Um, but you don't want a huge amount within the CV. Uh, you can add it as a, an appendix. But, but put the key points in. What are the, what's the key two things I've, I've discovered in my PhD? Put those in the, in the CV, but then perhaps have an abstract and more detail later on alongside your publications. Give me the other one as well, yes. Okay. And the second is, how would you, uh, what would you recommend to our students in regard to expressing their research skills? I mean, how they should express it if they have, for example, cell culture or... Yes, okay. I think, but well, let's take the second one first. Okay. Um, I think this comes to some extent where I talked about putting the CV alongside the cover letter as the the data and the results and conclusions. You can use your cover letter to expand what you've got in the CV. So, as you say, let, let's say you've got in your CV, you've done cell culture. Then in your cover letter, if cell culture is really important, you could describe a little bit more. Then you could use two or three sentences to say what you've done in more detail and that, you know, maybe that I'm doing cell culture, I'm in charge of, of um, ordering the culture media, you know, I look after the, the, the, film, the, the, the sterile hoods and things like that. So, so it can be in a, a small amount in the CV, uh, but you can then expand it. And your CV in this case will differ every job you apply for, that no two jobs are going to ask for exactly the same skills. So you might put the same information in, but you might all change the order. The one that's that's clearly the most important for that job, put that at the top. And then, again, explain more into it, it later on. So that, that's why I would, would suggest doing it. I say there's, there's no right or wrong way, but, but you can use your cover letter to develop what's in, the, um, what's in your CV. Uh, what adjectives? <laughs> that's a, a, a difficult one. Um, dedicated, um, enthusiastic. Uh, one, of, one of the problems is, I'm afraid, that now there's almost a, uh, I'm not sure what, what, what the correct word but it is, that there's a culture that, that's developed. That we get all these words coming in. Um, and um, there's even suggestions that uh, in, in some places, some companies use artificial intelligence to look for these sort of words, I'm an enthusiastic, I'm dedicated, I'm hard-working. Um, sorry? Reliable, yes, yes. Um, uh, team working. So all these things uh, come in. Um, it's difficult to say, but... but yes, I mean, it, it's, it's, they're the sort of thing. You know, think what, if, if you were employing somebody, Put yourself in the employer's position. What sort of person would you like to be working with you to help you? You're not going to want someone who's boring, who's lazy. Um, you're going to want somebody who's enthusiastic, who's hardworking. So just think about it in the same way. Um, put yourself in the position of the employer as, as well. And may I also add a suggestion? Because that's, this is something I really uh, find uh, coming up uh, very frequently is that the only CVs should be sent 
in a PDF format, not in a Word format. Yes. I think we should stress it for, the, for our students. Mm -hmm. And also, please be careful when you are naming your file. <laughs> So, if you want to... Yes, that, that, that's, I've, I've never actually thought about doing that, but yes, I think that's a very important point. PDF is far better yeah. uh, to do it, but yes, and, and do give it a, a sensible name, just your name, yeah. something like name and CV, uh, not, not something silly. And, and actually, name and CV, so it's easily, easily found. You know, if, if somebody's got a lot of applications, uh, it, it's, so it's clear that it's you. Uh, I mean, coming back to that, I, I think that the worst example of a CV I ever had was it didn't even have the name on it. <laughs> and the only way I could work out who it was, it had, a, it had um, an email address on it, but the email address bore no resemblance to the person's name at all. It was just a, a series of letters and numbers. Uh, the only reason I knew was I actually had a list of the participants in the session with their email addresses on it, so I could actually get back to the person. But, but yes, I mean, it, it just brings it home again just to, to make sure it's something that's easily found. And that, that's a good point, Fairhan. I've, I've never actually dealt with that side of things. And of course, when I started doing this, um, people were, were still sending most things by, by snail mail. Now it's, um, off, it's more done electronically. And of course, some companies or many companies will actually have their own version of the CV they want, so you'll actually be filling in, um, filling in information on, on a, uh, a page rather than having to do that. But if you've got the information in your CV and you've got it all there together, it's much, more, it's much easier then to take that information and, and put it into the, uh, the gaps. Um, what I've not talked about, but again is on the, uh, on the, on the uh, PDF that you'll get, is the Europass CV, um, which I hate. I really don't like it at all because it was never written for scientists. But what it does do is it makes you, it asks you questions. It, it, it asks you what, what job have you done and what skills have you got. So, so use it to look at it because it does ask you for the skills in it, but it, it's actually awful as far as, as um, applying for a scientific job is going, because that was what, not what it was designed for, it was designed for other things. And, um, but, but yes, it, it can be quite useful. Any other questions from your audience? Yeah, we will say. Maybe I can ask a question, going back to Hans' questions and mm -hmm. your answer to that. Uh, you said that the, the, the adjectives they use to describe themselves, but as an experienced person, uh, what make you believe that is well, that's where the evidence comes in, isn't it? I mean, uh, if you're talking about team working and there's no evidence in the, in, in the CV of, of ever worked as a team, you know, all your publications, just you and your PhD supervisor, um, you're, you're not working, you, you've got no evidence of team working outside. So it's, it's looking for things like that. Um, enthusiastic, again, you might get some information about the way it's written. To then, you know, if you write in a, uh, an enthusiast, that's why I say it needs to be positive language. If you don't write positive language, you know, um, then that's not going to tell me that you're enthusiastic. If you write in a boring way and say you're enthusiastic, do I believe you? Um, and then, of course, you get the opposite when you, you come to the to the interview and you're saying I'm an enthusiastic person, you're, you're sitting, fair hands interviewing me and you're sitting here like this and I, I'm a, a good communicator, I'm enthusiastic and you're sitting here looking at your feet all the time. You've got to be able to match what you say when you go for the interview. Um, again, that's, I'm, I'm just doing what, what one of the, the people at one of the CV sessions did for, for us before. Um, but you know, you've got to then match that later on. Um, so <laughs> And I think the other side of it as well is that you don't often do your colleagues any justice, as well, any good favours as well, because if somebody gets applications from one department uh, and they see a few of them don't match what they're actually looking for, then that will actually make it a problem for other people from your department. I thought, oh, I've had CVs from them and they're not really very good. Um, it'll start... Uh, having knock-on effects on other people in the in the, the lab as well. So it's, you're not just doing it for yourself, you're doing it for other people from your university, from your department, um, and so on. Because if, if you come over as enthusiastic, then, oh, yes, okay, well, I, I had this man, this girl from this lab before, and they were good, and um, then that will help other people. 
it's evidence. That's what it comes down to. Anything you can show in there that you've, you've done things. And often that's outside your science. Because often you can show these things better outside your science. And you don't disconnect your, your, your science life from the rest of your life. If you're enthusiastic in your science, you're probably enthusiastic in other things as well. Actually, our university has just started a new kind of a skill-based transcript for the undergraduate students. Mm -hmm. We call it AGA Plus. Yes, yes. So we are going to give them a transcript, skill-based transcript Excellent. at the end of yeah. the bachelor degree. Mm, excellent, because I mean, we know it, I mean, in the UK, and, and I, I suspect from, from talking to colleagues, I mean, we've had this ambassadors meeting of, of Feb's um, education the last few days, and we've had people from 25, 30 different countries, and talking to them, um, it's, it's, it's all the, the, the same sort of thing, but we know that large numbers of people will go outside their science. So your skills that you've developed in science can be applied to other areas. Many years ago, I, I had a slide, I mean, a long time ago, from a, it, it was talking about a, a, a company which was an accountancy firm, one of the big accountancy firms, I can't remember which one it was now, one of the big international accountancy firms. They employed more biologists than they did economics graduates. Now you ask your question, why do they do that? Because the skills that you learn in your science can actually be transferred to other areas as well. You learn data analysis, organisational skills, report writing, all those things which are very important elsewhere. Um, so it, it was an eye-opener again that, that, you know, to imagine that they employ more biologists than, than e economics graduates in a, an accountancy firm. And maybe I should again highlight that we will share your PDF yes, yes. on our websites, our faculties and Yeah, that's fine. And so all, the, all the links, well, they all worked last week, <laughs> um, so I hope they still work. They, they work when I left them. Um. You can at least search as a reference. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, the adjectives like reliable, yes. hardworking, these are better if they are described by another person than you. If possible, so yes. What is the role of reference letters? Do you think the reference letters are still important? Becoming less so, to be honest. Um, in Certainly in the UK, and I, I think elsewhere, um, I mean, basically, people have become frightened to write a negative letter for fear of being sued. Um, so, uh, you know, almost really now, m m most companies, as far as I understand it, I may, I may not be right here, will only really use the reference letter to confirm the details that you've put in your CV. So, it's different in academia. Um, because often we have informal reference letters. If you if if you've if you've got an application for a postdoc, let's say, then you will probably send an email to the, the, the to one of the referees and, and say, what can you tell me about that? And, and that that's more of a sort of scientific link. But in companies now, my impression is that they only really use the reference as a, just a confirmation that this person really has got that degree and they've really done what they say they've done. Um, they, don't, they, they use their own methods to find out. Things have changed a lot in that way and I think a lot of it's come down to litigation. Um, people are afraid to put negative comments in and so everybody's positive about everybody else. <laughs> Which is unfortunate, I think, but uh, I, can, I understand the reasons because you, know, you, you, can, you can have discrimination unintentionally as well as intentionally. Um, there. That's true. Okay. So, since there are no more questions, we can close the session. And thank you very much uh, for your uh, contribution. Thank you. For being with us here. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> it's, I think it's raining at home.
Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, this is Alfa, my dear colleague. She's also uh, worked in the 